Hello, good evening, or good afternoon. It's 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Friday, September 23rd, 2016. This is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com and also BlogTalkRadio.com forward slash election channel. We are an independent media organization, and we interview independent and third-party candidates who are on the ballots, who are going to be on the ballot this November 8th, who are running for Congress, sometimes other offices like governor, attorney general, mostly Congress, mostly the House of Representatives. We have interviewed some Senate candidates, and that are the only third-party and independent option in their district or their area, their state, etc. Today we have an interview with John Sawyer, who's an independent for the U.S. House in District 17 of Florida. Let's give them a call. We want to let people know there are independents and third-party candidates. We want to, uh, we believe a responsible media would interview these candidates, have them on the media more, invite them to the debates, because our taxpayer dollars pay to put these people on the ballot. And according to most polls, most people would throw them all out. Well, there are options, and there are legitimate options of qualified people and uh, people that have a uh, good work record, good principles, that gathered enough signatures, etc. So we're going to talk to one of them right now. This person's name is John Sawyer. We're going to call right now. Hello. Hi, uh, John Sawyer. This is Thomas Keegan. How's it going? All right. How's it with you? Good, good. You're on live at blogtalkradio.com forward slash election channel. I already gave you an introduction. Um, So, of course, you're running in Florida for District 17. And um, and I'm looking at your website here, which is Sawyer, S-A-W-Y-E-R, 2016.com. Uh, Mm -hmm. John Sawyer for the U.S. Congress, uh, the U.S. House. May I ask you, John, um, have you ever run for Congress before, sir? I ran briefly when I lived in Lee County in 2012. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, The one that the famous Trey Radle eventually won. But there were 16 people in the race, and they all had more money than I did. So I dropped out of that race and ran for Lee County Commissioner as an NPA. All right. And it shows here just a little bit about yourself. I, I mean, you're a family man, you're an entrepreneur, um, you're a veteran, you care about this country. And I would just think, I mean, I've interviewed about 17 people so far this year that are independents, third party candidates, and we hope to do 50 plus by the first or second week of October. And I would think there's 435 members in the U.S. House. We would should have at least, and I know you're an individual and I don't like to lump groups of people, but we should have someone at least of your caliber, to, at least one person there to you know represent us. You would think there'd be someone with some of the same ideas that you have. And can you just spend about five minutes, maybe ten minutes, or, or you know, just... A, a few moments to explain your platform, your issues, why you're running, why you're running as an independent and not a Democrat or Republican, sir. Well, uh, your suggestion that there's plenty of people or some people in there would agree with me is precisely the reason I'm running as an NPA. In fact, uh, most of the people in Congress don't agree with me on much of anything. In fact, because we only have the three-party system in this country, they don't need to agree on anything anymore thanks to the Citizen United uh, decision where uh, corporations are real people and no longer do our congressmen have to get their contributions, nor do they, from individual contributions. They get them from PACs, and most of them, because they get uh, contributions from the big uh business packs and stuff like that, they don't need to listen to us anymore. So like I said, there's three parties, Republicans and Democrats and incumbents. And it used to be, you know, these clowns in Congress used to get in there, they get elected, then they go and govern. Now they don't have to do it anymore. They get elected, they spend the next few years, in the case of Congress, they spend two years campaigning. We don't count anymore. We don't have to. That isn't where we, they get their money, their money, 
and they're not accountable to us, and I think they, they prove it uh, abundantly. My platform is simple. If you if you are looking at my website now, on the first uh, web page, and I I started this more or less as an informational web page back in 2006, and I dumbed it down because people thought it was too complicated. I actually kind of wrote it as a book and articles on how to you know how I thought we should solve problems. What a unique concept! A politician thinks we should. That he has an idea how to solve something instead of speaking in generalities. But across the front of it, if you notice there, I have enough is enough, throw them all out. And that's exactly what we ought to do. And I, I've spoken before groups and they say, well, they ask, uh, it's sort of what you just asked. Are there some people uh, in Congress you think you should buddy up with or some people that you emulate? And the answer is no. Which part of throw them all out don't you understand? People tell us, oh, our congressman's great, but they have an eight, <laughs> Congress has an 8% approval rating. So overall, we don't like them, but oh, our guy is great. That's nonsense. They all had their chance. Every one of these people that you see on television and everything, they had their chance to fix things. They certainly spent plenty of time screwing things up, didn't they? But instead of fixing things, they don't do anything. Throw them out. I spoke to, you probably don't know what BUPAC is, but it's a business uh, the whatever PAC stands for, political action committee yesterday morning, actually the first one of the first smart groups I've spoken to. And we had a conversation about uh, throwing stuff out and throwing the people out and all that stuff. And I lost my train of thought, so I'll skip that part. But anyway, I have solutions, and those solutions don't coincide with either the solutions of the Republican Party, the Democratic Party. Their platforms are an absolute prescription for disaster in this country. Now, Democrats, and I don't know which, I guess you're libertarians, right? Well, no, we're just, we believe in consensus. Like my saying is, let's say you have 10 issues that are important to you. Five of them have popular consensus and five of them don't. Which five issues are you going to focus on? And so we're looking for issues that libertarian, the left and right, libertarians and progressives agree upon and let's just focus on those issues first and then we can disagree about the other stuff later well that's probably a good idea i mean that's one of the problems of the two-party system and i'll get back to the what's wrong with their platforms but the two-party system it used to be when i grew up a lot of years (laughs) ago republicans democrats because they were weren't spending all their time campaigning weren't so divisive and I, though I was a businessman and, fair, and rather successful when I lived in the Midwest, and most of my f- friends were professional, but uh, we got along and we disagreed. We discussed political disagreements, and at the end of the day, we went home friends. Now politics is so doggone divided, particularly, and I'll say it, because of the Democrats. They're, I think the Democrat uh, concept of socialism is is rather – proven to be uh, something that doesn't work and they can't defend it anymore uh, I mean logically so they go attack the other side and then of course the other side gets even by attacking and answering back the selection we have for president now is a good example but you can't get things done if you can't cooperate and that and that really is the problem now the platform on the Democrat party is simple everything's free and that's a hard thing for Republicans or NPs or anybody to overcome now, it doesn't work. It didn't work in Venezuela. It didn't work in Greece. It certainly didn't work in the Soviet Union. And I don't believe we could ever get over there with working in North Korea. But it simply doesn't work because it's sooner or later and sooner is coming sooner than later. We can't pay for all that stuff. Anybody ought to know that not everything is free, and yet there's Bernie Sanders out talking to college kids who in my day would have laughed a guy out of the room uh, and they're applauding him because he's saying they deserve a free college education. And now I noticed last week Hillary Clinton kind of jumped on board. She's telling people, uh, young people at uh, what's the one in Philadelphia, the university, wherever she was speaking anyway. Penn State the NCAA, or... Now the NCAA champion, the basketball people. Anyway, oh, she spoke to them, yeah. and she told them that uh, that. They need to be free of that debt so they can get out 
and open businesses and create jobs. Well, on what planet do people get out of college and go into business? Well, they get a loan from the bank. That doesn't happen. That's not reality. That's talk that doesn't – with a person with my business background can say, that's just silly. Now, you get over to the Republican side. I think most people can agree, if you know who Jason Chaffetz is or Chaffetz, the yeah. Congress from Utah, he defines the government or the Republican platform thus. He said, um, what job creation, and I'm doing this all from memory, job creation in this country depends on the business decision of that transmission shop owner in Oklahoma City. What we need to do is reduce regulation and reduce corporate income tax on small businesses so they create more jobs. Now, that sounds like a reasonable thing. Most, Very few of your congressmen are entrepreneurs, if any of them, open their own business, risk everything they had to create jobs. A lot of them list their profession as businessmen. Of course, most of them are lawyers. But businessmen and you know, being an insurance salesman might be a businessman to you, but an entrepreneur is my idea of a businessman. I started with nothing. I had 27 retail stores. At any rate, here's the concept. And I heard, I offered my services to five or six of the Republican candidates and one Democrat candidate for president. And my business expertise, free of charge, but nobody took me up on it. I heard, and I was a Ted Cruz campaign chair for Charlotte County, and even Ted Cruz didn't want to hear it, and how we would create jobs and stuff like that. I heard Doc, uh, the doctor that ran, and several of the people, including Donald Trump, say, here's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about reducing the income tax burden on small businesses. We'll reduce, excuse me, we'll reduce uh, federal income tax to 15%. Well, I'm a businessman that actually knows what he's talking about. Small businesses do not pay income tax. They just don't pay it. So what good would it do to reduce it to 15% when they're paying zero? Well, we would reduce the capital gains. They don't pay capital gains tax either. And then people that are in business understand that. People that aren't don't, but I understand it's not being a solution. Yeah, We need different nice. solutions. I mean, small businesses are like usually S corporations, and so it's just the shareholders yeah. that are taxed when they pay themselves. But, yeah, their business is not actually taxed. That's right. It not wouldn't help them at all. Yeah. Right. The owner, essentially, it's owner stock owners. Otherwise, if you had shareholders, a limited liability is a different different kind of taxation. But you would think that at least somebody would understand that concept. But anyway, I read in the paper what yesterday that um, somebody's closing 100 stores. Uh, Kmart, not that that's a surprise. Sears is closing 100. Macy's is 100. But Walmart is closing 269 stores. Walmart. Those kind of headlines ought to tell anybody what's wrong with the Republican uh, platform for creating jobs. Stores are going out of business. Do we need any more Walgreens? We've got one on every corner now. Do we need any more Starbucks or restaurants or pizza places? One opens, somebody else closes. because. But yet, that is what the Republican and the reality nowadays of the future is to create jobs in small business. We don't need any more of these people. We, have, we need a different solution, and if you care what that is, we need to bring manufacturing back to this country. That will bring the middle class back to the country and uh, create wealth and generate income for the rest of the, you know, and the capital gain, excuse me, and growth for this country forever and ever. But I tell this people to people that should know better, Republican leadership, uh, business people, and they just kind of look at me blank, oh, that won't work. I'd sure like to know why I won't work because my platform is this. Bring the manufacturing jobs back to this country. If you want to know how, I'll tell you how. Yeah, we do want to know how. Yeah, please do. So, here it is, and here's the clunker. And I'll just set it up with this because Democrats mostly, well, Democrats all, have told us over the years, none who have ever been in business for themselves, told you over the years that corporations are mean, they don't pay their fair share, they're greedy and all this and that. The fact of the matter is corporations and Republicans go along with it because if I demonize corporations, for instance, and I tell the pe people out there like they're telling me, as we need to tax corporations and the rich and all this, 
people will applaud, we, yay, and uh, even conservative, or not conservative, let's say Republicans will go along with that because, you know, it's not their ox that's gored. But the fact of the matter is, if I turn around and tell people, I'm going to raise the taxes on you, everybody will go nuts. But the fact it is, when you put additional tax on those big, bad, rich corporations, they don't pay the tax, you do. They just raise the price of their goods. Do you want to tax General Motors another billion a year or General Electric? Oil? Their products will go up, and the people will wind up paying it anyway because corporations don't pay taxes. The people that buy their goods and services pay taxes. If you want to eliminate, you want to bring the jobs back here, well, let me say one more thing. Corporations, who owns corporations in this country? Uh, big people. institutional People well, own actually indiv- no go ahead because you're right because I usually forget that part. Individual people account for 26 percent of all this. You know, got to go buy a few shares of this, a few shares of that. 26 percent of the stock market, but 54 percent is owned by institutional buyers. California uh, Municipal Workers Retirement Union is the biggest owner of corporations. General Motors Retirement Fund is the second biggest. General Motors Retirement Fund has half a million, 499,000 shares of General Electric. Remember, greedy old General Electric. So the people own the corporations, not some rich people. I mean, they may overpay their executives. That's between the corporation and their board of directors and their stockholders. But here's the clicker. What can we do to bring those jobs back here? It's simply follow the follow of the example, or we say the benchmark of Ireland. You say, what is he talking about, Ireland? Ireland has the highest per capita output in, a, in manufacturing in, in the European Union. It has the third highest standard of living. There's only 4 million people in Ireland. Third highest standard of living per capita in the European Union behind um, Finland and Liechtenstein. And Liechtenstein's probably about as big as your office. It's a success story. How did they get there? You know, we've always heard about the poverty. They had 28% corporate income tax. The United States has 35%, and it's been the highest in the world for 70 years. We're the highest corporation. These greedy corporations pay the highest rate uh, for the last 60 years in the world. At any rate, Ireland dropped their tax rate to 20%. Corporations started sending their business over there. So they dropped it to 15%, and more businesses came. All the major uh, Microsoft and, and all of Facebook have all put offices in there. So what did they do? Did they sit down with Barack Obama and uh, Hillary Clinton? Say, oh, maybe we should raise taxes. No, no, they dropped it to 12%. And now I understand they're going to 10%. And they're prospering because of it. Now, here's the Sawyer solution with that set up. If you want to create jobs in this country, eliminate corporation income taxes, period. Yeah, they'll, come here, yeah. they'll come here in droves. Not only that, our prices can go down. Go down. We get rid of half of the lobbyists because they won't be lobbying Congress for lower taxes. They're going to get any lower than zero. Well, almost never. <laughs> and, hey, John, we would have an immigration problem, but not of like other people from other countries. We would have an immigration problem of corporations trying to come here, wouldn't we? Don't we see eye to eye on that? They would be fighting. Let's say I was a state of Michigan and say, I'm going along with a federal law for 30 days and say in the county of Wayne County where Detroit is saying, you sign up with us in the next uh, seven days, we'll give you free tax, uh, property taxes for five years and no state taxes. Uh, people would be fighting each other. You'd have to you think you've got riots in, in Charlotte County or Charlotte North Carolina now, they'd be stumbling over each other. You've never seen people argue or fight so much as businessmen for their money. They would be all over the place coming here. This is the safest place in the world to have manufacturing. And they, But the taxes are too high. If you're a corporation, of course you're going to move your Donald Trump. You're going to move your business to foreign countries because you can't afford to pay those kind of taxes. Why would you do otherwise, particularly if you export? I yeah, tell it's you just one a thing. double tax anyways, I mean, because you're already taxing the people who are like the CEO and, and all down the line, so it really is a double tax also. Well, the whole the system now that you mentioned, double tax, is it's, it's an unfair taxation because it's before profit taxes. That is, before they take the profits and distribute it to their shareholders, they pay the income tax. And then when the shareholders 
get their uh, bonus checks or whatever they get, dividend checks, they have to pay tax on that. So it's not greedy corporations, it's double taxation. And I'll tell you something I'll bet you don't know. We have a half a billion, half a trillion dollar trade deficit with China. They spend that half a trillion dollars doing the kind of mischief we've heard, you know, I don't have to explain those islands out in the Pacific and their air bases and their missiles and building up their military. Do you know how much in the rest of the world that China has a trade uh, surplus with the whole rest of the world excluding us? I don't know. No, 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 no. Zero. They take the $500 billion that they screw us out of, and they spend it somewhere else, and that's not an accident. Why would we allow something like that to happen? Donald Trump says, well, I'll put uh, tariff, and I'll put, uh, and, you know, those kind of, of uh, injunctions against them, which is not a bad idea. We should do something. But my idea is better. We don't have to do any of that. Lower our corporation's taxes uh, to zero, and everybody will come here. We'll have a manufacturing base. We'll recreate our middle class, and that's the end of it. And the economy will boom, and this is what we deserve. It's simple. And I try to sell the people, and even Republicans. Eliminate corporation taxes, and the faces go blank. Ooh, that won't work. So now, that's all i got to say. Is some corporate cronyism mixed in all that? I mean, most businesses, I think, are just out to make a buck and and offer a good service. But I mean, what would you do about you know people trying to buy themselves in the government? Is it just up to the people to keep you know their Congress people accountable, or is there anything else that you know we could do? Well, here's the problem, and being <laughs> running an NPA with no money, I can tell you. I'd certainly like to see something done, but we tried McCain-Feingold. Gosh, we'd think this would work. It didn't work because free enterprise for, for all the good things will always find a way around whatever legislation you pass cause, because they can, and we have a free society and a constitution. And so now we have, because of um, uh, the Citizens United decision, we have – right. Well, I told you before, now it's the PACs that control. We're trying to do the right thing, and this was bipartisan, McCain, Feingold being a Democrat. They tried to do something. It just doesn't work. You have to let the market system take care of itself. I mean, I'd like to I like to limit the kind of money you can spend, but you can't. There isn't any way to do it. There's always a way around it, so quit trying. What people need to do is get their heads out of their rears, concentrate, understand what's going on. Get your fingers off a keyboard and your face off Facebook and sit down and learn something, read a book, understand what's going on. Because this is a democracy and democracy takes work. And if you're not willing to do the work, then let's have, let's welcome the – some of you aren't going to want to hear it. Right, Hillary right. Clinton and the dictatorship, you know. It was John Adams that said, you know, democracy. you have a democracy or something like this, I'm paraphrasing here, but it's only going to last as long as, you know, you have a moral people and, you know, and I extend into that, you know, educated and informed people and people who are willing to participate. Uh, I mean, you have to have a responsible populace for a democracy to actually work. It's not if, – if people aren't participating, it's, you know, two wolves – you know, watching, you know, you know the, the the sheep or whatever. What about, let's hear about, um, what are you, and you're a veteran, so I'd be interested um, also in hearing your um, ideas about foreign policy. Uh, can you tell us, you know, what would be your approach to our, our current foreign policy and, and how you would like to see it in the future? Well, foreign policy is a, you know, if you want to be more specific, <laughs> foreign policy is a day long speech, but Overall, I would say we need to. We're not the world world policeman anymore because we can't afford it, and we can't afford to make the decision. When they put the European Union together, I don't care who they're kidding. They thought they're going to get even with the United States and show them what's what. Well, we're the United States and they're not. And that's that's all they ought to know. But let's say if your if your question is implying, what would I do about the terrorism and that kind of stuff that we have now? First of all. Let's look at NATO. We spend 72% of the defense on a bill in NATO. We pay it. We're not getting anything out of it. It's there to protect them. Now, this was all right 40 years ago when we formed NATO. 
because deep down inside, we didn't want the Germans to go out and start another doggone war, and the French, and they can't get along. And it's always nice to have people in Europe to look after that. And frankly, if we had people in Europe, we'd be paying those soldiers' salaries anyway, so let's not overdo it. We need to tell the people in Europe, you're going to have to defend yourself. And now that they're be, through their own uh, causes, they're being invaded by people, they're really going to give them a hard time. And by the way, they have a proposal. The European Union has a, an official proposal before what's left of their group to be self-defending. That's one thing. Now, if you get to the defense business, if Jimmy Carter and I, on my campaign, I have a T-shirt. Are you live now? Yes. Is your, yep. Uh-oh. Yeah, a switch. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'll tell you, it says across, and I wear it to all the speeches, and I don't do it for a, a laugh. And I'll send you a picture if you like. It says simply says kick Iran's ass. And you say, oh, I have people chuckling, but I'll tell you, people stop me at Walmart and say I like that, and it's particularly veterans, and they they point and say I I like that shirt. If Jimmy Carter had told the Iranians in 1979 when they took 400 took the captives for 475 captives for 444 days, he told them. I'm going to deliver a pay. I'm going to fly our plane into your airport Friday afternoon at noon. Have the people ready to go on board. And if you don't, Saturday I'm going to come in and kick your ass. We wouldn't have had any of these problems. So people, the problem we have now is, and it didn't, wasn't a problem in World War II. The World War II lasted three and a half years. At the end of three and a half years, my dad was in the Philippines, Saipan, Okinawa. At the end of three and a half years, the people back, not that I remember, but I read the papers, the people people were sick of the war. They wanted us to come home in an important war like that because it had already been won in Europe sometime in May. At any rate, we have a, a attention span of up to three years if the cause is right. This is my opinion. We'll go to war and we'll fight. But what we need to do now since Vietnam, when the politicians sat back, they wouldn't bomb. Them. And I was in Vietnam. Those people were coming down and thousands at a time, coming in through Cambodia and shooting us from the rear and from the side. And McNamara and Johnson wouldn't do a darn thing about it for reasons I won't bother you with. But we lost a war that we easily could have won. The South Vietnamese had two million people there, and they're pretty decent fighters. If you get a war over in two, three years, people will understand. But, hey, I want to tell you, George Bush and Barack Obama, people die in wars. And you can't procrastinate and let it go out long and have people come home with broken limbs and missing parts and stuff like that for 12 or 13 years and expect the American people to go behind it. If you want to go to war and the cause is right, you go to war, go to war to win it. We could have taken... uh, Iran, we can take them out on a weekend. But I'm going to tell you, in 10 years, when they've got a nuclear bomb, and they're already bringing in the Soviet missiles to protect those things so they can protect themselves against the inevitability of of Israel attacking them because their, life, their lives are on the line. If we wait 10 years, we're going to be mighty, mighty sorry because we won't be able to stop them then. They'll have nuclear weapons. They'll have a delivery system that can hit everything, on at least on our coast east and west coast, and it's going to be too late then. Iran is a funder of Hezbollah and Hamas and PL, Pew, Pew, over there, <laughs> those guys. <laughs> Not to mention ISIS and the, every terrorism group in the world. They're, they're the people responsible for the bombing, the coal. They're the people responsible for the people getting killed and, and our soldiers in, in Lebanon. And when they make the IEDs, take off the arms and legs of our military in Afghanistan and Iraq. They're made in Iran. And I'll tell you this, if we just take out their power stations, go out and bomb them in and in the middle of the winter and these people are sitting there in the dark trying to make an IED, it's pretty tough to do. And it's also tough when you're freezing and saying, death to America, you know what I mean? Kick Iran's ass and the rest of it will disappear, you watch. Yeah, either do it or don't do it. What about Syria, Libya? Should we, you know, just keep the status quo, contain, or just get out of there and focus on Iran, do you think? Or 
Well, the problem is to begin with, and this is one of the few things I agree with Barack Obama, only I would say it differently, and I will in a second, is what is it our business? And I I asked my wife, I said, I don't have any Syrian friends, do you? On either side, I don't care. They've never been our friends. Why would we step in on, on I've sure worked in Afghanistan stepping in on their behalf, didn't it? So I have no argument. As far as I'm concerned, if you've got the... Um, uh, Assad, Shiites against the professional um, Sunnis and the Iraqi Sunnis and the uh, Iranian Shiites, hard to keep them close, right. uh, it's fighting each other. I don't have a friend among any of them, although I dated a Syrian girl for four years, but she was Catholic. At any rate, uh, what is it my battle if they kill each other? I don't care. I mean, I care, but I don't. I don't think Americans should die for their cause. Uh, whether we go, I would go into Af- Iraq. I agreed I would, but I won't get into that. And I certainly we should go into Afghanistan. They, on 9/11, they knocked down and killed 3,000 Americans. But I don't have a big deal with it. But now we're into a situation, backed into a situation where we may have to take sides or not because we didn't get tough 10, 15, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. George Bush had gone in there, put in a military governorship in Iraq, whether you agree with what he did or not. And if he had done that, I put MacArthur in, you know, I'm a MacArthur type like they did in Japan, and put them in charge in Iraq until the people came around, heck with this blue thumb business, until they understood what the meaning of democracy was and left our troops there. We wouldn't have had these problems. But he, he chose not to. And while you're at it, what in the world is he doing making one united Iraq? There's no historical Iraq. We didn't That's do true. that in Bosnia, Herzegovina, or when Yugoslavia broke up, they were all killing each other. We went in there and made them separate countries. Worked out pretty doggone well, I think. And why wouldn't we here now? This Iraq was carved out of the old Ottoman Empire because they sided with the Germans in World War One, and it didn't happen until the late 20s and early 30s. And they have the Shiites, and I'm pointing to my imaginary map, in the upper right-hand corner, so that would be the north east. And then you got the Sunnis in the southeast, in the central part, in Baghdad. And then you've got the, oh, did I say Sunnis? I meant Shiites. And the Sunnis in the rest of the country. Why didn't they divide it in three countries? We wouldn't, ISIS are Sunnis. They're the people that used to be, a lot of their leaders used to be, um, uh, Saddam Hussein's guards. They're Sunnis. Give them their country. Give the uh, uh, Kurds their country. And yeah. give the Shiites their part of the country. I mean, it certainly worked elsewhere. I don't care what Karl Rove says. It's on my website. He's, he was plain wrong. It was just a bad decision. Just I don't they want to, They're not united. Okay. Why would we try to unite them? Yeah, it, it was an artificial country. Um, what about... Um, uh, Guns, but George I, Bush I, didn't I, know that. That's the problem. George Bush didn't understand that. That's the problem. Now, what no, he didn't know that. He didn't know that at all. Oh, now you did mention on your website. I do want to hear your position on, um, you know, uh, why we have the Second Amendment? Why do we have the Second Amendment, John? Did you like? Did you like that write up? <laughs> I didn't read I the whole a, thing, but well, it's long, and you got to click on the bottom and go to the to the historical part, you know, it is long-winded as I am on, when talking to you. But when people have misconceptions about it, I think it takes a while to explain and get through that, all that stuff. The Second Amendment, Sean Hannity, has to do not with people. He says militia means people, nutcase. It doesn't mean any such thing. Militia means the military. Militia is a militia, but we needed a militia. Uh, after the Revolutionary War because we had the English to the south of us and the islands and everything, the French north in Canada and the, uh, every American tribe in the world on our western front. And I'm talking, you know, uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, that area. So we had a problem. We couldn't go to the individual 13 colonies and say, hey, send us a militia like we did in the Revolutionary War. We could go home on weekends or after one year. We needed a national military, the national but the Congress, the founding fathers, had extreme problems with uh, a national military. And if you read the, uh, the uh, what is the name of that thing where they describe the Constitution? Anyway, the um, oh, 
something letters. Uh, the Federalist Papers or something? Yeah, like the that? Federalist. And I've read it. When I read my copy looking for stuff, I dog-eared and highlight it. At any rate, they explained in there, we have a, a rightful fear, as we did in under uh, the English did under Cromwell and Charles II, Charles I, that they tyrannized their people. We didn't want this. But we needed a national military. So they figured in order to a militia being whatever it says required, uh, it is the right of people to uh, to uh, bear, uh, bear arms. And it is. That meant that every American could carry a gun. And it's not to guarantee, or as some conservatives like to tell you, the Tea Party people, to protect your right against burglary. We didn't have that problem in those days. To protect your family. It was to protect the American people against tyranny from their government. That's all they wrote that for. That's all they meant for the Second Amendment to be. So when I hear people argue, well, we can cut back. On, we don't need to kill deer with an automatic and blast them full of holes. That's nonsense. You don't understand the concept of the Second Amendment. It's, we need, if we have to, we need an AR-15 to protect ourselves against a military who might be a million and we're a hundred million. We need those weapons to protect ourselves against tyranny from our own government. Yeah, they're by the, way, the weakest argument, which is not good. So. Well, it's always the ignorant. The people don't understand the history. I, I used to put myself to sleep reading the uh, Federalist. But I've read it three times. It's really boring. But you have to understand the Constitution's on what? If you were to type it out now, it would be like three type pages. It's on one page. It doesn't carry a whole lot. Even the amendments are quite brief. It doesn't explain stuff. You have to look at, at original intent. And it's clear. The Second Amendment is clear if you read what the founding fathers, uh, why they passed that amendment. But people who don't understand it or don't want to understand it or have other uh, agenda uh, will tell you this, what I just told you, the nonsense about it. We need to be guard, guard ourselves against government tyranny. Yeah, and I think another way to interpret well-regulated is um, it just means that people are allowed to be well-organized and well-regulated, like people can get together. And um, so, so one way of saying something, some people could interpret well-regulated, meaning that it's controlled by the government, but other people could um, d define well-regulated as um, that people get together and freely regulate themselves well -y. I mean, they're um, not just uh, a bunch of hooligans. They're actually practicing, and, and they're well-regulated. I mean, it's like your car is well-regulated. So, um, mm -hmm. so, so because it's designed very well, and it's, you know, had a lot of practice. Let's go through a couple other things. Um, what about, uh, I just want to touch on a couple issues here. What about, um, you know, renewable energy? You think that's a free market thing, or you think, um, you know, the government should help invest in a renewable energy like solar and, and possibly some other forms? Uh, is that something we should be looking into? Is that something you hope for? I don't see the government investing in anything because it's politics and people invest in their own buddies and their friends, and then we get uh, Solyndra. Which right. is just to pay off it. I, where are you located, by the way? You have a nine four one. You must be around here somewhere, right? No, I'm in I'm in the Florida area as well, just a little bit under Tampa. So yeah. Well, then you're Tampa. close to me. But when I ran for commissioner in uh, Lee County, there was a, con a company that was opening up called VR Labs. It just opened up, and and the county had given him five million dollars to bring in um, for Alga Fuel or whatever they were doing something some kind of a new company. And I wrote on my webpage at the risk of being sued, I said, this, this company is a scam. When they're talking about the eight employees, you're going to employ 250. The eight employees, I said, what do you bet? Here's the names. I put the names of them on there. I said, they're going to go for a couple of years and then take your money and run. That's exactly what happened. I don't like government. Government shouldn't give money to anybody if Solar energy is such a wonderful thing. Let private enterprise develop it. They certainly developed uh, uh, Windows 10, didn't they? We didn't need it. Now, I will say this. There are examples of times when government over in our history has worked with private enterprise to develop so Eli Whitney's interchangeable parts in uh, 1808. 
uh, for weapons and muskets and stuff was a, ne- a necessary thing, and they took him six years in investing, and it paid off. But rare, and Gatorade is another good example. But other than that, the government should stay out of it. The government shouldn't be in business. If it's worth developing, it would be developed by private enterprises, plenty of private capital out there. The fact well, of the matter is... Living get in the way i mean there shouldn't be extra burdens to put solar i think we're going to have a referendum you know that uh, there's the big utility companies don't solar and stuff like that so i would say at least don't make it any harder for people to get solar you know well they want to well i mean there are solar products available now they're going to co- going to cost more and i but i think that i mean if you can't keep the politics out of it what good did it do for the government to give all? And by the way, they gave another $25 million to uh, Elginal. That's another Lee County scam. And that's going to go under. Even the commissioners down there are taking my advice. But it doesn't work. These people, are, they go in, they put a big building up, they spend the money. Here's what you do if you want somebody to come in and loan them money. You tie them down. No limit. If you see a limited liability corporation after their, their name, excuse me, hang up because they're crooks. There's li- reason for limited liability. If they want to come to you for millions of dollars as your government agency, you would do the same thing they used to do for me when I used to sign leases, at least some of my early ones, or any of the other people. You sign personally, or you sign your other assets away. You don't separate this corporation from your other scam. See what I mean? You've got to be a businessman. Just because you're government doesn't mean you can give everything away. But as a rule, I don't think the government ought to give anybody to develop anything. Yeah, I, I agree with it. And people should be more responsible and, and more liable and you know, so they're more accountable. What do you think um, – let me just ask you another question here. Uh, do you think um, the government should invest in sending someone to Mars? We sent – I think one of the greatest things is we had sent someone in the 1960s uh, – to the moon, um, do you think it would be good for morale, good for technology, good for science, etc., to send someone, you know, even if it's just for a month or so, uh, to Mars? You notice that since uh, like four or five years ago they stopped the space shuttles, that suddenly all these billionaire guys are developing their own programs. Oh, what a surprise! Yeah, but yeah, in the interest, in the interest yeah. of science, I think this is an interesting thing because. I think man in 500 years is going to develop more of his brain power if he keeps developing it and skips socialism. <laughs> and that the things that we think that are impossible today will be possible. And I think in the interest of general interest of, of just humanity and just intelligence, which we seem to lack these days, this is something we should have an ongoing program to do. I think we owe it to future generations to do this yeah. kind of thing. You don't start with, I think it's money sp- reasonably spent. All right. But it's, All right. See, that's and not a private, that's not a for-profit thing. See, here's what I like about it. The government can do some good things, certainly the Center for Disease Controls and, and some of the stuff they, they do. And like I said, Gatorade was developed with government help. But uh, by and large, I think it should stay out. But I'm very much for sending, I'm not going to be around long enough uh, to see it, but I think it'd be wonderful we can find out what's going on in Mars and out in future space. And who knows if we someday our planet's depleted, we may have to move there. Yeah, I like the reasons that you said for, especially for future generations. I mean, you know, that's going to help them uh, for sure. Um, What about, um, I just want to ask you about election reform. You think there should be any reform? You think third party independent candidates should have easier access on the ballots or a more level playing field as far as the election system go? Do uh, you think there should be public debates or what, what, what do you think about, um, you, you know, uh, elections or do you think just people need to get off the couch and participate more a combination of both? If you look at the, the, um, listing of registered voters and I get an update every month that in most counties down here anyway you're looking at in this area maybe um 40 percent Republican 30 percent Democrat and you know and tw- but the NPAs the people independents INTs whatever that is and those things those people amount and combine with the Democrats they outnumber Republicans there's a lot of people but I know most of the um uh 
county election supervisors, and they'll tell you with a good deal of truth that most of the NPAs are Republicans. Nonetheless, as I told you, going across my or my the theme of my campaign is enough is enough. Throw them all out. We have to throw them all out. When I spoke at BUPAC yesterday, I said half the people in this room could do a better job than most people in Congress. And I think the other half think they could do better too. It's just a simple job. As Bill Buckley used to say, I could take the Manhattan phone book, pick out a better representative. Of course, he was talking about versus the Harvard. I was faculty. just going to – I was just thinking that. I mean, every you could just pick people out of the phone book probably every two years or something. Yeah. Well, even then, and somebody asked me, well, what would you do about the experience? These people come in with any experience. Hey, the people that are in Congress now have no experience in, at anything. They've never worked in manual labor. Almost none of them have ever been in combat or been in the, had military experience. Very few, if any of them, have ever started a business. They don't identify. I belong to three labor unions. I own 27 retail stores. I know how it is to work. When Paul Ryan comes up with his scheme, we can save Social Security by having people work till they're 70. Oh, really? I can be a congressman till I'm 70, work three and a half day weeks, which is why I'm applying for the job. <laughs> but anyway, I can't get up on a roof at 110 degrees and do it. I could be a lawyer or a, you know, oh, your honor at 80 years old, I object. You can do that, but you can't do hard manual labor when you're 70 years old. Why would Paul Ryan propose that? Because he never worked a day in his life. He doesn't understand how hard it is. And it isn't the same as working out as he does all the time in the gym and in the, in the Congress. The people have, at any rate, let's get through that. I told the people, my daughter worked for, uh, in the, for Mike McCurry in the White House. I asked her one day, you know, she hadn't had a security clearance. I said, really? Because the FBI came to my door. I said, well, how close do you get to him? He, she points from me to her. <laughs> I said, gee, you ever in a room alone? Yeah, sometimes. At any rate, she worked for CSIS. She's been around, wa around Washington a long time. She graduated and got her master's from George Washington. It's the staffers that run that up there. Rookie congressman like John Sawyer goes up there, and you keep the staff, and the staff tells you how it's run. They tell you really what you ought to do, straighten your tie, shine your shoes. They do all that. Those congressmen couldn't find their butts with both hands if they tried. We don't need them. That's why you could take half the people in the Manhattan phone book and put them in there, and they would fit just fine, but they'd have a whole lot better attitude. They might actually think, you know, I just came from the from the private sector where real people live. Maybe I ought to represent real people because your congressmen do not represent real people, not any of them, not your congressmen either, sir. So are Here's you going to be room. in the debate? Huh. Are, there, are there going to be debates in your district? You think Tom been? Rooney... Tom Rooney would have a debate with me, well, defending his record on the green algae he, he and his sugar pals and uh, put into the Lake Okeechobee and stuff. You know, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, Vietnam Wall replica that they have a tra had a traveling show where they would had they had a half size replica and they sent it around. It came here to my hometown Punta Gorda three years ago, and eighty thousand people viewed it in 30 days. So the big shots and some of the retired generals around town decided, well, let's put one in ourselves. So they went out and to the Tom Rooney's and they couldn't raise a dime. So long comes a guy named Bill Akins, four times Bronze Star winner and Vietnam veteran. He says, let me help you raise the money. They ignored him. And he's a sergeant. We're generals. Got it? Came around the second time when they weren't raising any money. You want me to help? Third time he comes around, this is him his words, by the way, at his Warrior of the Year uh, banquet in his honor. And he says, the finally the third time, he says, you want my help or don't you? So they put him on board. He literally went door to door and got a half a million dollars, and we are putting an exact half replica. It's already done here in Punta Gorda. It's going to be a huge draw. Six weeks ago, he wrote on his Facebook page something you and I would identify with, Bill's own Facebook page, calling Tom Rooney, our congressman, a traitor because Tom Rooney voted for the Obama budget next year. I mean, doesn't the guy have the right to object? I sure object to it. Bill and I were on the Republican Executive Committee. Most of the Republican Executive Committee thought it was a bad vote. Tom Rooney calls up the general and says, either Bill Akins apologizes to me or I want him off that board. 
and Bill Akins wouldn't apologize. So off the board he went. This is a war hero who's called yeah. the face of the Vietnam Wall, and your congressman has the gall and the power to step on him like a bug. And that's the way things I are. would like to hear you explain that in a debate with him. Yeah, I mean, so do you think... Oh, so would I. Be, that's why it won't happen. I mean, no. should there be, like, maybe a public election channel, or, or should PBS or something offer a debate with all of you all, or, or sh- shouldn't there be something oh, like that? Oh, absolutely. And wh- how do we get that law in? Well, we go through Congress, and they have to pass it. Bleh. <laughs> you get the point. Yeah. It ain't never going to happen. That's the, the foibles of a free society. The people that are running it, unfortunately, uh, run, are running it into the ground. No, it'll never happen whether I like it or not. Well, if I, I'd John, ring his me, butt good if I got in a debate with him. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, let me ask you just two more questions closing up here. Um, what are some of your favorite people, past or present, elected or not? Well... Because I have such a high opinion of myself, I don't necessarily have heroes. But uh, in the, by the way, and the one Democrat I supported and tried to campaign and help out. And by the way, the only one of the six, 17 candidates following me on Twitter was Jim Webb, fellow Vietnam veteran. I wrote him a letter. And I said, you know, I, I always thought you were pretty much of an asshole. But I think that uh, I like your politics. I think you'd make a good president. And I think he would. He's the only senator I know got arrested for carrying a gun in the Capitol building. Well, he's in the trunk of his car. At any rate, I think that uh, Dwight Eisenhower, when I was a kid, we all felt safe. And Dwight Eisenhower was president and said to the Congress, I'm not going to pass these or sign these silly bills. Don't even. That's why they call it a do-nothing Congress. It's really a do-nothing president. He didn't want all this nonsense, all these regulations and stuff. So he says, I'm going to go out and play golf. You go ahead and do what you want to do. That's my kind of guy. We felt safe in those days. If Iran had taken hostages in, in his, uh, the Eisenhower administration, they would have been darn sorry. That's why they wouldn't do such a thing. These are the kind of people. I'm a fan of George Washington uh, because, you know, he sacrificed. You know, He's out of office for what? Two, two years and he died and it's just unfortunate he spent all of his you know by the way you know what george washington wanted to do for a living no what's that i mean he wanted to no, be a high he wanted to be a ranking officer in the british uh, army and he didn't understand if you weren't naturally born british you didn't go higher than captain i mean he was he was with him to begin with and didn't do such a good job but at any rate george washington and abraham lincoln for keeping the the country together but uh, i don't other than that i'm i'm not real fond of people <laughs> that's great I, and, and george washington also warned us about um in his farewell address um oh yeah oh yeah are likely in the course of time and things to become potent engines by which cunning really? ambitious and unprincipled men will be enabled to subvert the power of the people and to usurp for themselves the reins of government destroying afterwards the very engines which have lifted them and now mm-hmm. let me ask you this uh, what let me let me ask about? you this before you get done. Do you know who wrote that? I probably his speechwriter, but I don't know who that is. Nah, uh, you would think everybody would say who Washington's address. His he wrote it was so bitter because of the of the uh, accusations from the Jefferson people. He said he wanted to be a king and a dictator. And of course, that has something to do with the the uh, Jay Treaty that nobody knew about until it was too late. But anyway, he was so bitter about it. And Alexander Hamilton says, you can't go down to history writing this. Let me rewrite it for you. So anyway, what's the next question? Oh, okay, very interesting. Well, what are some um, events that you have coming up uh, before November 8th? I just finished two weeks of nonstop, and I'm taking a respite. So I, I have an interview with the, um, let's see, the newspaper, what is the Sun-Herald on Tuesday. And I've got a couple speeches, but... Uh, I'm really burnt out, <laughs> so I don't yeah. have a lot. Oh, I'm going to probably be, oh, what have I got here? Let's see. The Sawgrass uh, Community Association is having an open forum October. I haven't decided on that yet, and then there's another one. Uh, Kenny, I just got back from traveling all over the state and everything. I'll tell you, and my car's transmission is messed up, so I'm just... Uh, well. 
I hope maybe some fellow veterans, other citizens, um, like, you know, that one sergeant or whatever, people um, can get behind your campaign. I think, you know. Well, he's behind my camp. He's one of my best friends. Right. When this happened, he came to me and said, you know, and I, I went to bed for him. I went to call the general up while they were at the meeting. I said, you people need to reconsider. I said, you want to keep this in-house? This means a lot to us, this wall. I'm a member of the Vietnam Veterans of America. And I said, we need to settle this now. I said, and I swear without a bit of condes- condensation, no, condescension, <laughs> I told the general, I said, you know what is, he has a right, First Amendment right to speak out. He earned four bronze stars defending Tom Rooney, a non-combatant, um, Fort Hood lawyer, right to free speech, and yet he has enough nerve. If General Carr should have told him to kiss his butt, but he didn't because they're partners and buddies, and he did that. I don't know, Bill Aiken's a good friend of mine, but I hope we get the veteran. Every veteran should be really ticked off about what happened to one of our own. Yeah, and, um, you know, you never know. This could be the year. I mean, the polls certainly say that. Uh, at least you can, like John Adams said, you might not win, but you can deserve to win, and um, and they ended up winning. So, um, well, John, you know, all right. to John to- Adams. John Adams was – so above it, he says, I'm not going to campaign. I'm, being either. I'm the president of the United States. I'm not going to comp- – he did no campaigning. That's why he lost to Jefferson. Well, wait, when he was talking about the Revolutionary War, he said, um, you know, we might not win, but we're going to at least deserve to win, you know. But they did yeah, end up right, winning. Good. And um, uh, I heard that. But, it's in the papers. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the ones that aren't as popular. Um, and uh, so, yeah, good little quote there. Um well, again, it's Sawyer2016.com, Sawyer2016.com. Even if you're not in the district, I mean, you would potentially have two years to, uh, you know, be a U.S. representative. And, um, John, it's been a pleasure. I do appreciate your time very much. And um, so thank you very much for the interview and uh, enlightening our audience as to some of the choices out there in America right now. We appreciate it. All right. You bet.